Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this week's Master Instructor Roundtable with myself, Wendy Batts, here with my friend and colleague, Mr. Marty Miller. How are you? Great, Wendy. How's it going today? Oh, you know, it's so good. It's it's a beautiful day out, so can't complain. That is good. Same here, South Florida. It's it, it's that time of year. I'm blessed. Well, you're actually home, so it's like you know we don't have to guess where you are this week. So that's it's good. gonna start <laughs> back. It's it's I had a little little bit of like a two week straight through, so no one knows what to do with me here locally. But no one knows what to do with you anytime locally. Fair, or not, so. fair. but <laughs> at least when I'm on the road, there's a little variety. So I, I hit the road tomorrow and. Now we it's it's on for the next couple months. So fantastic. Well, I'm excited about this week's episode. I know I say that all the time, but we are going back to a part two. Marty and I, gosh, this was months and months ago. We talked about book clubs and we shared with you guys some of our favorite books and why they were our favorites, and talked about the importance of reading and how that can help us grow not only just personally, but obviously professionally. So we decided today we were gonna do a part two, but really like be very specific on a book that you and I both love and hold dear. So, yeah, no doubt. This is a book you can read over and over. And depending on where you're at in your career and your life, you can pick up new things. But first and foremost, we're going to go through some of the reasons why you should read outside the obvious. And then we'll dive into the actual books. We'll keep it secret for a little bit. So people are going to have to stay with us to figure out which book we're talking about. Yes. So what we're going to talk about is the importance of being a passionate reader and why that's key to success. Um, reading is the number one habit ultra successful people have in common. And how much should you read? I mean, that's the big thing for me. How much how much time do you have first and foremost? And you know what? If you can't read, I'm telling you the audiobooks in the car on the drives, especially because I live in Atlanta. I'm stuck in traffic and always on the road. That has been my key. Um, but then again, how can you apply non-fitness material that you're reading into what you're doing, especially if you have a fitness career? Yeah. And even the Audible, we've talked about this before. Uh, I'm pulling mine up now. Um, I like to do it when I'm working out because it helps me focus more mentally instead of just drift off from music. So it's, you know, to me, there's always a, a way to do it. So I'm looking at my library. So right now, this is not the book we're going to talk about because I'm just getting into this one. I'm reading Lifespan or listening to Lifespan by David Sinclair, PhD. So maybe there'll be some nuggets I take out of that and we bring to one of our Master Instructor Roundtables. I'm not going to share the book that I'm reading. So, <laughs> Well, you got to text me now. I need to know. No, no, it. mine's really just about, you know, I'm one of those people. Let me just say this because I'm not promoting this book, but I am one of those people that love um, the royal family. So oh. I have decided to purchase the book and I am just, I'm just starting. So there you have it. I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to judge. Not. <laughs> well, there you go. So, all right. Well, you know what, Marty, the importance of reading. I love this, this statistic. I know you found it, but um, you know, when I, I've actually read this book and 88% of successful people read at least 30 minutes per day. And when we say reading guys, we're not talking about social media. Um, some people are like, I read all day long and I, you know, I'm reading people's posts and Instagram, you know, while that is part of reading, yes. What are you doing really that's going to resonate um, with your learning? Um, and maybe that is, that's how you learn. Maybe that's, that's the route that you're going. But Tom Corley had, um, conducted a five-year uh, study in which he interviewed a host of self-made millionaires. He concluded that reading was a key factor in their success. Yes, indeed. Shocker, right? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? But, you know, my mom, she's an avid reader. She and she, I don't know. Don't ask me why she tracks the book. She's in like, I'm going to have to ask her. I should have like 4,000 books or something crazy. Oh, I have a client that reads like a book a month. Like, and, and I'm not talking just like a couple hundred pages. Yeah. I'm talking like, these are very, what I would say, big books. <laughs> Big, big boy and big girl books. Big boy, big books. Yes. And so, you know, for every Christmas, that's what his family gets him is a new set of books. You know, right. 12, they try to do 12, one for each month. And I find that fascinating. Yeah. Um, but he's also a history buff. And I will say out of personal experience, my husband is an avid reader. Um, him and his mother, you know, I mean, his family, they grew up reading books. They love reading books. And you know what it shows because they're both very, very smart. They are yeah. two individuals you do not want to watch Jeopardy with because you will lose people. <laughs> it's crazy how much my mom reads. I mean, I mean, it's it's in the thousands of books. So she reads almost like one a week. Oh, that's crazy. 
I mean, I, I would love to be able to do that. I just don't have the time. I mean, I'm going to be very honest. I mean, I, I already try to juggle life as it is. Right. I do try to read. Um, I do find certain days to read, but I can't read before bed because half the time I'm, I do read. How about this? I read every night before bed. But they're car Tell books. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, I, you know, Pete, you know, Pete, uh, what is it? Pete, the cat, read him often. Okay. Um, Splat, the cat, we read him. Uh, <laughs> Captain stuff. Underpants, I know all about him as well. So if you guys haven't, you know, read in, or read any of those books, they're very uh, interesting. <laughs> I want to see how you can correlate that to a master instructor roundtable. So that's your challenge. Oh, uh, well, you there's got to be a story embedded in there somewhere. Uh, you know what? I think we'll probably have to do some interviews and I can easily correlate that. <laughs> there we go. So I'll jump into this one here. So what should somebody read? So, or again, even going back to why. So individuals with an annual income over $160,000 or net worth of 3.2 million. This is from 2017. So you could extrapolate that out now. Read for self-improvement, education, and success. In addition, they tend to choose educational books and publications over novels. Now, there's not anything wrong with almost like being distracted once in a while from a novel, like you'd watch Netflix and just kind of get into a story. So we're not saying not to do that, but you can see a concentration on self-improvement, education, success, business, and in particular, they obsess over biographies and autobiographies of other successful people for guidance and inspiration. And Wendy, we've talked about finding mentors. So sometimes you can find a mentor through reading and like I get success magazine. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be a mentor that you're with physically Sometimes you can gain knowledge from somebody that you'll never meet. And then finally, individuals with an annual income of 35000 or less and a net worth of 5000 less read primarily to be entertained. So we're going to talk about that E versus E ratio. So you can kind of see how you choose to pick what you are reading. Yeah. And I mean, again, you know, it, for me, I get I read a lot of of student papers. So I have to read a lot of research. I have to read a lot of people's thoughts on very specific you know, topics that we may be covering that week. And sometimes I just need to change. And it's okay mm -hmm. if you are stuck in that same rut where you feel like all you do is just, you know, read people's work and, and you know, kind of help them grow and whatever it is that you're, you're learning about or you're teaching. And, you know, with mentors, I know they also say that to us. I know my mentor, which was also as Marty's mentor, when I first started out in the industry, he gave me like 10 different books. And he's like, if you want to be successful, you need to read these 10 different books. And, you know, we've discussed a bunch of them on our last episode that we did. And this one that we're talking about was awesome on that list. And they all served a very specific purpose. And I think if you find someone that reads, they can help you grow because listening to successful people, how they made their money, how they grew in their career really can correlate to what you're doing today in order to be where you want to be. Yep. Without a doubt. I always say if you want to have something, find someone who's already accomplished it, right? So, you know, that's, that's the key thing is finding that mentor, finding people that you can attach yourself to, you know, whether again, it's reading or meeting with them and, you know, that way you, you can't help, but grow. You must grow. You must water it and grow. Exactly. <laughs> so this is the E versus E ratio that Brian Tracy did a long time ago. And I've used this many, many times, including with my kids who are grown adult men at this point, but that's another conversation, but they're still kids to me. You'll see that one day there, Wendy. Um, the average person spends 50 minutes, so this is an adult, on entertainment versus one minute on education and personal growth. So E versus E, education versus entertainment. So the study showed if you took it down to five to one, you're still doing five times the amount of entertainment versus education, but it's down from 50. You basically doubled your salary. So clearly there's a, a, a reason you should still have the entertainment in there, but at some point you really need to focus on that growth mindset, even as an adult and reading is an easy way to do it. I mean, you can roll back into college and take online courses of, for sure. But if you want to still have a maybe less regimented way, like what I used to do when, when I actually, I still love a physical book, but now with my travel and stuff, I do the audibles. I used to go to the bookstore and buy 12 or so at a time. And I'd see him stacked up there and it forced me to, oh, okay, I got to get through this one so I can get to that one. So, you know, I think that that E versus E ratio is critically important. Still get your entertainment in, but five to one is probably better than 50 to one. And, you know, one thing that I think got me, you know, started back in reading was 
I found topics that I didn't know a lot about. I was interested in them or people were discussing them and they may be new to the industry and I wanted to grow. So therefore I could be in the conversation. And, you know, once you start listening to other people's conversations and finding out kind of maybe where you're not, where you don't know everything. Um, that's when, that's where I started with my books. And, you know, again, my mentor told me to start here, Marty, you and I talk a lot about different types of books and you're like, Hey, I just finished reading this one. This was fantastic. You know, I, we subscribe to the same magazines. You know, I know we listen to some of the same podcasts, but you know, what is it that's going to take you one step further? And that actually is going to be what brings us to the next slide and where we're going to spend a lot of our time. Talking. Right. Dun, dun, dun. What is it? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, oh. You're teasing. There's still a little more. <laughs> so we're getting there. We're close. But reading has been shown to help prevent stress, depression, and dementia. Fascinating, right? While enhancing confidence, empathy, decision-making, and overall life satisfaction. So like, why would you not want to read? Well, and I think too, you know, I, I feel like as I've gotten older, sometimes I'm not as smart as I used to be. I don't know if you feel that way. But I, I don't feel, you know, when I'm reading books sometimes to, to my son, I'm like, wow, these are really big words for a first grader, you know, and in all reality, they're probably not. But, you know, and I was writing things the other day, my hand got sore and my eyes got sore because I wasn't, it wasn't something that I was doing very often. So when they do say that it helps, you know, kind of re-spark your eyes and your brain connection, I really think there's something to that. Right. No, no doubt. For sure. I can only imagine what big words were in Captain Underpants that had you. Hey, you know what? Don't judge. I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm inquisitive. I'm want to learn. See, it's actually a series. If anyone cares, so. Yeah, I'm waiting for the movie. I'm telling you. Well, this is on today's uh, Master Instructor Roundtable with Marty Miller and myself, Wendy Vats. We're talking about book club number two, and this is actually the importance of reading. You know, just challenging your mind, trying to find time throughout your day to take care of yourself. You know, grow yourself and your education and your personal growth, but then also how it can relate into what you're doing professionally. And the book that Marty and I are going to spend the rest of today on um, is really talking about the seven habits of highly effective people. And I love this book because, you know, Marty and I, when we get to the next um, slide, we're going to talk about each one of the habits and how we personally feel they've helped us, but then how it can, and can relate to what we're doing professionally as well. Yeah, you can see he's highly accomplished. He has other books, but this was kind of his gold standard. And he's been gone now for 11 years, and just about. And it's still one of those books that people talk about that this is a must read. And he did one for teens and all that. But this is, to me, this is a must read. Powerful lessons and personal yeah. changes, if you will. Yes. <laughs> yes. So number yeah. one, Marty, yeah. you know what? Yeah, I want to say it off, or you want to go with this one. Yeah. You know what? I think I, I, I think I'm going to say it, but I know you are really, really good at this. And together, I think this is what makes us a good team. Number one, you must be proactive. So why don't you take us take us to the next level? Why? Yeah. So, you know, I don't know where I learned this. I don't know how I got this way, but I'm always forward thinking. And it could be that I read this book at a critical part of my life right out of college, right as a young adult when I was thinking about having a family and stuff like that. So Wendy knows me. I'm always thinking 20 steps ahead. I've got my to-do list. I'm always trying to prioritize and I'm trying to say, okay, current, uh, you know, situation, future consequences. How do I think about that and get ahead of things? And I've always tried to do that with my kids as well, teaching them like, Hey, you know, you should have been able to see this coming. Here's how you get ahead of it. Uh, you know, because I always tell the, the boys, life's going to be confusing enough and throwing enough curveballs. So if you set yourself up for success and you're proactive, you're more able to handle all that. But then when we talk about our clients, right? Being proactive could be a, a lot of different things. Wendy, you know, I travel a ton. I just packed my bag for tomorrow, right? I got a uh, 4 a.m. wake up call. I'm going to do it ahead of time. I packed my vitamins, my, my snacks. I'm being proactive in my health, you know? So there's a lot of different ways. But with our clients, being proactive could be making sure that they have their appointments and that they never cancel their appointments. It could also be, you know, time blocking, whether it's for me personally, when I want to read or whether it's whether they want to do their mobility work, their correctives by being proactive and putting it in their schedule. You're more likely to get these things accomplished. So we could look at being proactive in so many different ways, but it's critical to have that as a cornerstone in how you want to live your life, both personally, as well as in that fitness space, whether it's for you or your client. 
Well, and I think, you know, before we even go into number two, when we say proactive, I know with my clients and myself, being proactive is really looking at your schedule, you know, scheduling, like you said, doing the time blocks. They have to make sure that they are scheduling themselves for that time, that they are going to be committed to that time. And as you said, when we're working on on their health, what is it that they need to get at the grocery store? You know, making lists, being prepared, having the right shoes, having the right clothes, things that sometimes we take for granted because it's our job and we do it daily. We want to sit down with our clients to make sure that they have everything to be successful in the very beginning. So talking about this stuff ahead of time of what the plan is and letting them know that, listen, you know, we're going to schedule this out, but personally have your plan, you know, know exactly. I know that's going to blend into number two, which is begin with the end in mind. And I think this is very important for me personally. One of the biggest challenges I've ever done was sitting down and doing my one, three and five year plan. Where do I want to be by the end of this year? Where do I want to be in three years? And where do I want to be in five years? And being, quote, proactive and taking the right steps to make that happen. So that's why I think those are a really good blend. And then when you're thinking with your clients, that's when you're sitting down building the rapport, but you're having, what is their goal? Why are they there to see you? What made them, you know, walk through the door to want to be connected with you and make that step towards their fitness journey? Because those are going to be things that are going to be important to help them stay on track that you can keep bringing up over and over again, but then you can also do the right assessments, reassess, and then also make sure that, you know, everything that you're doing makes sense into their journey and that they can see progress because if they don't progress at all, they're not going to be happy with you and they're going to leave and then you're broke. <laughs> right. Then, you know, so one saying we've all heard is those who fail to plan, plan to fail, right? So if you're not putting, you know, the end goal out there and Wendy, you and I you talk about this all the time, you know me, I'm always talking about when I want to retire, I have a number, I know how to break that number down backwards into what do I need to do weekly, monthly, et cetera. There's a lot of different examples, but you've got to know where you're headed. You know, so think about like Google Maps, you put in two destinations, you put in where you are and where you want to go. And then the path is created for you. So if you just go out of your driveway and start taking left turns, you know, you might be like driving around NASCAR. I know that's big in your family, Wendy, but you've got to know where to take a right turn, where to go straight, where to take a left. So again, where am I at? Where do I want to be? And that's how you start to move. And then we're going right into the next thing is put first things first, right? So if you now have your destination and your journey, there's going to be curves and things you have to tweak, but what's the first step? What is that first thing to initiate movement in the forward direction? So that could be when we're talking about with our clients is this is why we do corrective exercise. This is why we do foam rolling. This is why we start in stabilization endurance. That is the first thing first. You can't get to where you want to be. As we've always said, you got to earn the right to get there. So we know with rule number two that you're going to get to power. You're going to get to your high intensity. You're going to get to your running. But first, we got to look at how what's the quality of movement. So this is why when we were talking about this, when there were so many like dual tracks, we could talk about our professional life, personal life, as well as in the gym with our clients, that these seven rules make so much sense. Well, and I think, you know, you're talking about the model in general, but think about right. even the day-to-day -day workout that they're doing, right. you know, first things first, grab your foam roller or grab the per, per, any kind of percussion device, you know, get your tissues prepared. So therefore you're going to be successful in your workout. So you have to do things first in order to get the goals that you want. And, you know, when you're looking things up, if you were just to put, put first things first in the website, it'll all say, you know, you know, work first, work hard, and then you're going to be able to play hard. You know, think about what we're doing with our life. And, you know, you're, you're working on a 401k. So therefore later when you retire, you have money to play. So you're working now to play later. And same thing with, with your, you know, with your clients, when you're approaching that, you, you tell them there has to be a plan. And then at that point, we have to make sure we're taking the right steps. We have to work hard in order to get to those end results. And that's where this, I think, falls really, really well into, into play. And even going to a smaller level, I won't go into great detail, but from a program design standpoint, am I starting in the sagittal plane versus the transverse plane versus the frontal plane versus, you know, even when I choose my exercises in a phase of training, right? Like there is a logical first step to go through. So yeah, this one, I think, is uh, a perfect uh, opportunity here to, to look at how we decide our 
training outcomes, as well as in our life, what's the most important thing I need to knock out today to keep myself on track and, and prevent myself from getting distracted, et cetera. And I think the next one's really important when you think when, when, guys, you've got to be, you've got to be positive and you've got to think you can. It's like the little engine that could, I think I can, I think that's another book. There you have it. And yes, I absolutely have read that multiple times. And, you know, right when you think that you can't, then that's where you're going to change your mindset. And that's where people fail when, especially when you're talking with your clients, you have to be positive and you have to think, you know what, everyone can win every battle can have an ending that's positive as long as you're making sure you're taking the right steps to get there. But if you believe you can, and you truly believe that you can, you tell yourself that you put sticky notes everywhere, you put positive, you know, you're always having positive vibes around you, then you, you will be successful. Surround yourself with people that have that same mindset, be around winners, if you will, not the people that are going to bring you down. And understand that, you know what, whoever you surround yourself with, you will start to mimic and be like, and, you know, everyone wants to be like Mike. So why not? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. We're dating ourselves, Michael Jordan. I get it. <sighs> yes. But anywho, but even with the think win win, you know, we put in clients choice uh, into the OPT model after years of just going through it in a more systematic way. And, you know, Wendy, I have rule number two, give them what they want while you give them what they need. Sometimes you got to give a little bit because that is the most important exercise for the client. As long as it's not going to cause any problems, right? Let them, you know, do their burnout on the triceps for the gun show like Wendy likes to talk about or all she does is bicep curls anyways. But <laughs> that's her own personal training but for herself. But, you know, you got to let them kind of think that they're winning the situation as well too, right? And then same thing in, in your own life, whether it's people in your home, whether it's work. It, no one likes to feel that they lost. Everyone always does better if you uh, think that there's a win going on. So I think this is just sound advice. Yes. And I think this one is the hardest by far. And mm -hmm. I say that because I want you, when you're listening to this podcast, I want you to step back and think about how difficult this is. Because I know for myself personally and professionally, this has taken a lot of time, but if you can do this step and you really practice it, you can be extremely successful in your relationships, in your friendships, as well as your professional relationships and in your business, which is to seek first to understand and then to be understood, which means listen first before you speak. And that that is really hard because sometimes we think we know what the client's going to say or we think we know what they want and we put words in their mouth when in all reality, that wasn't what they were trying to say, but we're jumping to conclusions. And so truly listening to a client and listening to the people around you before you offer opinions or you offer suggestions or you offer advice, if you can do that, you will be very successful in everything you do. Yeah. And sometimes it's just out of pure excitement because we want to share our knowledge and, you know, you could just kind of overwhelm people and they're like, you didn't hear a word I said. So there's a lot that goes to that. So, you know, I think that that is critical uh, in, in so many ways, like you said. And then building off that, going into number six, synergize. That could be a lot of different things. You could have synergy with other like-minded people. Wendy, you've mentioned this before. So it could be who you put around in your life so you can grow. But even in the fitness space, Wendy, I know that you do a lot of manual therapy. So if there's a personal trainer around that, that's not their scope of practice. You could synergize with them back and forth where they now refer to you. You refer to them. It could be doctors. It could be nutritionists. It could be building that network of people. So your client has the best team around them. And that synergy only adds value to you. It doesn't take away value from you. Yes. And, and like you said, Marty, I mean, even tomorrow when I'm working with the clients that I have, they're coming from another personal trainer that knows that what they need is something that I can help them with. And we do, we work, we work together very well because he's also very open to my comments and my feedback and what I found. And so therefore he's very successful as a personal trainer because on a, on a corrective exercise standpoint, he can incorporate some of those things in my findings and it's a win-win for the client we work very well together. So he's busy. He keeps me busy when I'm not already busy. But even if you don't have like a special license or anything like that, and you build your network, synergizing with the people in your community, working with the people that bring you business, that's only going to help you grow professionally. But, you know, having those relationships, you never know when you're going to need them. I think that's also important. And if you have professional athletes that come to you and you can help them 
be better on the court or the field, you know, because they're becoming one with their body and how they're moving and they produce at a higher level, it really can be very beneficial whether someone's just starting an exercise or at the highest elite level, but you have to listen first and then work together. Working together is better, Marty. So well said. And then the final one here is sharpen the saw. So personally, that is what we've talked about. Put yourself in a situation where you can constantly grow. Uh, tr test yourself. Go out and learn new skills. Go out and do new things. Well, even if it's a hobby, you know, like I, I did martial arts for years. I started in my early 30s, right? So those things can help uh, you know, elicit a different, you know, outcome for you. Go outside your comfort zone and maybe do public speaking, but then study it, learn it. So you're all, we work in an industry that requires continuing education. So it's kind of pushed through into us, but embrace that continuing education process. Don't be like, oh, I got it. No, be like, yes, I get to do my continuing education. And then for your clients, that could be all kinds of different things. Teaching them to be a little more self-reliant because that way you can get into other things. Maybe teaching them a little more about other areas that they didn't know about. Maybe now they want to compete in a 5K. Maybe they want to do other things. So it's just kind of letting them understand that this is a journey with, sorry, got to bring it up, a race with no finish line, but get them to understand the process. Teach them about what you've been doing all these months and weeks or years and just let them become a bigger advocate so they can speak to it to a higher level as well, because that's probably your best advertisement is an educated customer who can go talk to their network of people. And I think one of the highlights when I was reading the book and one thing that stuck out too, when you're thinking about this one particular habit is that you have to find balance. Mm -hmm. I struggle with this one a lot because I have a lot of different things going on and I want to be the best at everything that I want to do. So I really do try to put my best foot forward. That is the type A overachiever that I try to be, which I do not recommend um, and I'm working on. However, you know, really trying to find balance within yourself, within your family, within your career, and then making sure that when you're looking at the quote saw and you're going back and forth, that there's no teeter totter, because again, you want it to be nice and solid. And then you want to grow in the areas that that's only going to help grow you professionally and personally. So, you know, just to kind of give you a recap, if you're not looking at the slide with Marty Miller and I today on the Master Instructor Roundtable talking about book club, we really wanted to highlight the seven habits um, of highly effective people. And so when we're talking about those, number one was to be proactive. Again, you're in charge. You need to make sure that you know what you want to do. You got to make sure that you're taking your care of yourself. No one's going to do it for you. You have to be in charge of your life. Number two, begin with the end in mind. What is your plan? Make sure that you know what the outcome is because you can't plan your journey unless you know what the final result is. Number three, put first things first. Like I said earlier, you want to work hard, work now, and plan to play later. So do everything that you can up front. And then, of course, you want to, number four is think win-win. You know, if you think positively and then you think that you can do whatever it is that you're trying to do and you have that win-win mindset, you will win. And number five, seek first to understand and then to be understood, which just means listen. Listen before you start to talk. Listen and really uh, embrace what it is that's being told to you and then provide any kind of advice or feedback, whether it's to you or your clients. Number six would be to synergize. And then number seven, sharpen the saw, which again is finding balance. Like you said, really going after things, Marty, that's going to help you be even better and put you on the forefront above some of the others that may be competing for the same thing. And, you know, I think if you do this and you look between client behavior and relationship versus personal habits, they were going to go hand in hand. The seven that you're doing for yourself, you really should apply in your business. And if you can, can see the synergy between the two, then you will be well balanced. It really does kind of all mold and play within each other. Yeah, no, this is a book that, like I said, I, I have never gotten rid of it. You know, I, I donate a lot of books after I, you know, keep them on the shelf for a while, like, cause I'm not going to go back to it. So this is one I'm like, no, nope, that's staying on the shelf. You know, I have more. it behind me. I was going to go get it. I also have it in audio. I have all right. of it. I have, the, I have the old CD, but I don't even have a CD player anymore. So I probably could get rid of that one. Yeah, <laughs> maybe make it a poster. So you just, you know, nostalgia or something. But, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're going to do with CD. Um, you I don't either. It. You know, that is probably one I can give away. But yes. yes. <laughs> so your son's probably like, what's this mama Frisbee? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So no, I think that uh, the key takeaways here is be a passionate reader, balance it, you feel free to go out and get, like I said, 
get that mind escape and read an adventure or this, that, the other, but just make sure that you are truly have a game plan on how you're going to gather new information. Can you find the time? Can you afford not to find the time, right? If you want to double your salary, I do. So make it easy on yourself. Audible. That's what we use. Um, I'm in plenty of airports, plenty of airplanes. So I have zero excuse time block, put it in your schedule and then just simply make it a priority. Well, easy. Said. easy. <laughs> well, Marty, today was fun. I, you know, I really love it when you come up with these topics, like, Hey, why don't we discuss what we always discuss on the phone? And I'm like, you know what? It makes, it makes for a good podcast because again, we can highly relate to exactly everything that we're saying. And right. we do try to do this. We hold each other accountable. So like it, when we say that you want to be around like-minded people, Marty and I, he'll say something along the lines of, hey, have you done this? I'm like, you know what? But I said I was going to. I haven't. I'm going to put that on my calendar and that's going to be next on my list. So just know that surround yourself with really positive, smart individuals and you will also be successful. But yep. if you have any questions, you can always uh, email me at wendy.bats at nasm.org or you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And my information is coming up right now, dr.martymiller72 and email marty.miller at nasm.org. So, Wendy, great job today. I think uh, I know I gained some ideas again. Hopefully all of our amazing NASM family here did. And so those of you that took time out of your busy schedule to join us today, thank you so much. And of course, we look forward to seeing you next week on the Master Trucker Roundtable.